open your Bibles to Matthew, the 20th chapter. Matthew, the 20th chapter. I want to read three verses of scripture for our text. We won't be long. Matthew 20, verse 17 says, And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way, said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day, he shall rise again. We focus on the rejected and the risen king. You may be seated. We open with the scripture on the resurrection, and I'll get back to the resurrection and its importance, but let's first look at the week leading up to the resurrection. What he had to go through, he meaning Jesus, to purchase our freedom. Take note that Jesus says in our text a prophetic statement as to what would happen to him. He said, behold, we go to Jerusalem and the Son of Man shall be betrayed. The week started out with him being hailed as the king and ended with him being crucified for being king. Let's pick up the account at his arrest in Gethsemane. In Luke 22, it says, Then Jesus spoke to the leading priests, the captains of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him. Am I some dangerous revolutionary, he asked, that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there every day. But this is your moment, the time when the power of darkness reigns. In the night of Jesus' arrest, he was brought before Annas and Caiaphas and an assembly of religious leaders called the Sanhedrin. In Matthew, we read the account, then the people who had arrested Jesus led him to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of religious law and the elders had gathered. After this, he was taken before Pilate, the Roman governor, sent off to Herod, returned to Pilate, who finally crucified him, sentenced him to death. There were six parts to Jesus' trial. Three stages in the religious court and three stages before the Roman court. I want to take note that Jesus was tried illegally four different times. And not one time was he found guilty of a crime, let alone a crime that required the death penalty. The trial before the religious court. I want you to take this journey with me. He's been arrested. Now he's on trial before the religious court. This trial was before Annas. John 18, starting at verse 19. said, inside the high priest began asking Jesus about his followers and what he had been teaching them. And Jesus replied, everyone knows what I teach. I have preached regularly in the synagogue and the temple where the people gather. I have not spoken in secret. 
Why are you asking me this question? Ask those who heard me. They know what I said. Then one of the temple guards standing nearby slapped Jesus across the face. Is that the way to answer the high priest he demanded? And Jesus replied, if I said anything wrong, you must prove it. But if I'm speaking the truth, why are you beating me? Then Annas bound Jesus and sent him to Caiaphas, the high priest. And then the trial before Caiaphas and the high council. You see that in Luke 22. It says at daybreak, all the elders of the people assembled, including the leading priest, Caiaphas, and the teachers of religious law. Jesus was led before this high council. That was the Sanhedrin. And they said, tell us, are you the Messiah? But he replied, if I tell you, you won't believe me. And if I ask you a question, you won't answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated in the place of power at God's right hand. And they all shouted, so you are claiming to be the son of God. And replied, you say that I am. Then they took him before the Roman court. We keep reading in Luke 23, this entire council. Remember, he's in front of the Sanhedrin. So this entire council took Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor. And they began to state their case. This man has been leading our people astray by telling them not to pay their taxes to the Roman government and by claiming he is the Messiah, a king. Just lying on him. So Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, you have said it. Pilate turned to the leading priest and to the crowd and said, I find nothing wrong with this man. Then they became insistent. But he is causing riots by his teaching wherever he goes. All over Judea and from Galilee to Jerusalem. It got insistent. So then we read the trial before Herod because in Luke 23 at verse 6 when they said from Galilee to Jerusalem <laughs> he said oh is he a Galilean Pilate asked because he didn't want to deal with it so he said well when they said that he was when they said that he was Pilate sent him to Herod and Tempest because Galilee was under Herod's jurisdiction and Herod happened to be in Jerusalem at the time. Herod was delighted at the opportunity to see Jesus because he had heard about him and had been hoping for a long time to see him perform a miracle. So he asked Jesus question after question, but Jesus refused to answer him. Meanwhile, the leading priests and the teachers of religious law stood there shouting their accusations. Wow. So then Herod said, okay, let me, let me deal with you. Let me send him back to Pilate. Luke 23 and 11. Finally, they put a royal robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. In verse 12, Herod and Pilate, who had been enemies before, became friends that day. Then Pilate called together the leading priests and other religious leaders along with the people, and he announced this verdict. Listen now. You brought this man to me, accusing him of leading a revolt. I have examined him thoroughly on this point in your presence and find him innocent. Herod came to the same conclusion and sent him back to us. Nothing this man has done calls for the death penalty.
penalty. So I will have him flogged and then I'll release him. Then the people put him on trial. Luke 23, verse 18. Then a mighty roar rose from the crowd. And with one voice they shouted, kill him. And release Barabbas to us. Barabbas was in prison for taking part in an insurrection in Jerusalem against the government and for murder. Obviously guilty. Amen. They said, now give us the murderer and kill Jesus. Pilate argued with them. He argued because he knew it was wrong. But he argued with them because he wanted to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Give us Barabbas. Crucify him. And for the third time, third time, the third time, somebody say third time. For the third time, he demanded, why? What crime has he committed? I have found no reason to sentence him to death, so I will have him flogged and I will release him. For the third time. But verse 23 says, but the, mild, but the mob shouted louder and louder, demanding that Jesus be crucified. And their voices prevailed. So, Pilate sentenced Jesus who he knew was innocent, to die. Wait a minute. As they commanded. As they had requested, he released a murderer, Barabbas, the man in prison for insurrection and murder. But he turned Jesus over to them to do as they wished. Oh, my goodness. Palm Sunday, we had the long-awaited entry of the king of Israel. The Bible records the purpose of his coming. For this purpose, it says in 1 John, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. But they said, crucify him. Yeah. Acts 10 said, this is the message of good news for the people of Israel. That there is a peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. No, crucify him. His coming was twofold. To destroy the works of the devil. And to make peace with God for us. No. Crucify him. Give us the murderer. And he came to accomplish this work. By his sinless life. Because they could find no fault in him. Over and over again. The Roman court says he's innocent. Talking to the religious people. He's innocent. Why do you want to kill him? What did he do that's worthy of death? I found him not guilty. Crucify. Give us the murderer. 
This is Resurrection Sunday. The resurrection, as I said in my opening, has a special place, special place in the Christian faith. We have to understand the importance of resurrection. But before there could be a resurrection, there had to be a death and a burial. Crucify him. He had to die. But he's innocent. Crucify him. He had to die an innocent man. Give us the murderer. Because he had to die and be buried in order to be resurrected. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. Stand on your feet real quick. Lift your right hand to heaven. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I hear your word today. And it's falling on good ground. I receive your word. Change my life. Get another hand clap for that. You may be seated. Crucify him. Give us the murderer. Crucify him. Give us the murderer. Why is the crucifixion so important? Because he had to die. But he had to die innocent. They had to bury him. But resurrection, he had to get up. But understand, the only reason he got up was because God was satisfied with the sacrifice. And so the resurrection, the, one of the first reasons why the resurrection is so critical, because there are three main reasons. The, the number one reason is that the resurrection is God's vindication of Jesus Christ. They said he was innocent, kill him, crucify him. The religious people said that he's not our king. We don't want him. We'd rather have an enemy, Barabbas. So when God raised Jesus from the dead, he was vindicating the fact that Jesus is king. It says in Romans 1 and 4, and he, Jesus Christ, was shown, he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. So even though the religious court of the Jewish council and the secular court of the Roman governor rejected Jesus' claim to be the son of God, God said, he is my son. And I'm going to show you. Get up. <laughs> okay, come down. God intervened. And reverse their decision by publicly raising him up from the dead. And then the second main reason that the resurrection is important. Because the resurrection is the sure seal upon God's offer of forgiveness and salvation to every repentant sinner who will put their faith in Christ. What do you mean by that, Brother Jerry? That the resurrection proves that God will forgive you your sins. <laughs> if you put your faith in him, 
The resurrection proves that. Romans 4 tells us, and when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too. Here's why. Assuring us that God will also count us as righteous. If we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. In verse 25, he was handed over to die because of our sins and he was raised to life to make us right with God. So whenever you think about the resurrection, what it establishes is that God has forgiven you of your sin and has made you right with him. Well, how do I know? Because Jesus got up. He was handed over for our sins, but he was raised to life to make us right with God. Don't you know that the only reason you're right with God is not because you act right? It's not because you quote scriptures. It's not because you run to the local fellowship. What makes you right with God is that Jesus got up. Yeah. Glory to God. If Christ had remained on the cross, if Christ had remained in the tomb, then God's promise to the sinner of salvation and, turn, and eternal life could never have been fulfilled. He had to get up. Because it's only the risen Christ received and confessed by faith which brings the sinner pardon and peace and eternal life and victory over sin. What? The risen Christ. If he stayed in the grave, you'd still be lost. Glory to God. That's why the very first thing that we tell people about becoming a child of God is you have to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Wait a minute now. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You have to believe God raised him up. You have to believe that. Because if you don't believe he got up, you're still in your sins. If you don't believe you, he got up, you're still lost. If you don't believe he got up, then you have not been made right with God. You have to believe he got up. That's why people say, well, I believe in God. Yeah, but do you believe Jesus got up? No, but I believe in God. Then you're still in your sins. Because the Bible says you got to believe that God raised him from the dead. You got to believe that. I said, you got to believe that. If you don't believe that God raised him from the dead, then you're still separated from God. See, his resurrection is an absolute necessity as a basis of God's offer of salvation. He offers salvation to those who believe that Jesus is Lord. And that he got up. I like what Paul said, and I quoted this a little bit earlier to the Corinthian believers. He said in 1 Corinthians 15 and 14, if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. Did you hear that? So if you don't believe he got up, why are you in church? Why do you even gather together? Just go ahead and sin and die.
because your faith is useless and I may as well drop the mic and go home. My preaching means nothing if he didn't get up. Are you listening to me? Then he says in the 17th verse, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. And in that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. If you don't believe he got up, then everybody died that you love is lost. Yeah. Oh, that hurts, brother. Yeah, it is. It's true. If you don't believe Jesus got up, the way your grandmama asked who believed in him. Where your great grandma? Where your great granddaddy? Where your brother? Where your sister? Where your cousin that, that, that believed in him and, and served the Lord? Where they are? They lost if Jesus didn't get up. <laughs> but let me tell you something. He got up. He got up. He got up. Thank you, God. Then the third reason for the importance of the resurrection is that it constitutes the culmination of all our hopes as Christians. And it's the supreme goal of our life of faith. If you don't believe he got up, then why serve him? If all you believe was he was a good man and died, then why are you serving God? Philippians tells us, Paul said this, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. He grabbed me for something. And I press on to obtain what he possessed me for. Well, if I don't believe he got up, then why do anything? I press on. Notice what Paul says, that I may know the power of his resurrection. And if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Did you hear that? Our attitude as believers should be the same as Paul's around the resurrection of the dead. Amen. Amen. That the reason I run this race is because one day I'm getting up too. Come on. <laughs> hey. I don't believe the grave is the end of the story. If Jesus got up and he promised me, I would get up too. I'm going to close with this passage of scripture. 1 Corinthians 15. The one I open with because I need you to hear it as we close. Tell me this, Paul said. Since we preach Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of your sin. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope is only for this life, we're more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, 
Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who believes to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised at the first of the harvest and all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. And after that, the end will come. <laughs> when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and every authority and every power. Believer, you know why you're called a believer? Because you believe. What do you believe? That Jesus is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead. I'm glad to say I'm a believer because I believe that Jesus lives. I believe that he's alive and he's alive forevermore. I believe that he lives and he's on the right hand of the Father making intercession for me. I believe that he's my Lord and my Savior, my King and my Deliverer. I believe that he is my God and my Keeper, my Helper. He is my Comforter. Dead folk can't do that. But he's alive. He's alive. Tell your neighbor, he's alive. I hope you believe it. He's alive. Stand to your feet. He's alive. He is alive. Say it like you mean it. He's alive. What's his name? What's his name? Jesus is Lord. And he is.